Oscar if he was getting a little strong with his voice. <laughs> The title of our sermon today is Making the Right Choices. And our text is um, Genesis 25, verses 1 through 34. But let's ask God's presence here before we get into our text. Almighty, my wise Father, we come before you at this particular time and we thank you for the many, many blessings that you do give us. We thank you, Father, that we can come before you. I, I just was not able to find my pen and uh, to write down the words of one of those songs that we sang today. Lord, reign in me. In my darkest hour, in my darkest dreams, reign in me. And Father, that has to do with choices that we want. And we as Christians need to have that attitude. And we may need to take that attitude with us every day all the time because we are constantly making decisions and Father, we want them to honor and glorify you in our lives as your people. So as we go through this sermon today, we pray that we can understand the importance of pleasing you and what we do. We ask your blessings upon what's said and that the understanding will hear what's coming across and we can apply these things to our lives. Come before you and pray in Jesus' name, amen. Making the right choices. You know, this is an interesting subject matter that we are looking at today. No planning on my part, maybe on God's part, as far as what we're going to be talking about today. But it really does tell into the subject we talked about last week. Remember how last week Paul said in uh, Romans chapter 7, verses 15 to 25, that he had a struggle. He said it was a raging war going on inside his body between doing what was right in God's sight and following the law of sin that was naturally in the members of our body. The law of sin is naturally there. And that's what we have to fight about. Paul said, and I'm just going to read a, a little portion of that in um, Romans, the seventh chapter, about what Paul was talking about. Romans 7, verses 21 through 25, Paul says, So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is there with me. For in my inner being, I delight the, in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work in me. What a wretched man I am. Who shall rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is this thing that's waging war in us, but we have a solution. And he says, he, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have in our sermon for today the story of Esau and Jacob. And they dealt with struggles, make, making the right choices. Let's read our text, which is in Genesis, the 25th chapter, starting in verse 19, verses 19 through 34. This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aranian from Hadan Aran, Aram, and sister of Laban, the Aramian. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. 
the Lord answered his prayer and his wife Rebecca became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her and she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to the Lord, went to the Lord in prayer. She inquired. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two people from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first one came out was red and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebecca gave birth to them. Verse 27. The boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebecca loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to his said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. This is why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil soup. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. That's some story, some impactful story. Isaac and Rebecca had been married now for almost 20 years and didn't have any children. Isaac prayed to God about the situation, which again we see in verse 21. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer and his wife, Rebecca, became pregnant. Notice also that Rebecca prayed to God in verse 22. The babies jostled, jostled each other within her and she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Why am I having this turmoil in my life? I'm sure she's seen many pregnant ladies and many babies born, but I'm going through some real bad stuff right here. And lo and behold, they had twins, twin boys. Verse 23, the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two people from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first came out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so they named him Jacob. Esau and Jacob were twins, but they were different in personality and character. They seemed to be constantly at odds with one another. In fact, they seem to be at odds even in Rebecca's womb. Did you get that? Jacob came out holding Esau's heel. Jacob was grabbing and holding the heel of Esau. Was that competition? Maybe as to which one might exit the womb first? 
We don't know. We don't know, but they seem to be at odds in their character even. Have you ever noticed that? Twins born, and one is grabbing the other? I want to come out first. There was some stiff competition there. Verse 27. The boys grew up, and Esau became a, not, a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. There was even differences in the way they enjoyed life. Esau was a skillful hunter, and he loved the outdoors. But Jacob was kind of a homebody, smart, but more of a mama's boy. Verse 28. Isaac, who had a, a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebecca loved Jacob. Wow. And here was another thing that set the boys apart. The parents of the the preferences of the parent for one over the other that kept them in a sense separated and this even filled more animosity between the boys you know when the parents get in the picture and really show preferences that's not good that's bad Now, brother, we've seen over and over through the pages of the Bible uh, this lack of proper child-rearing principles. Isaac and Rebecca loved their, their boys, but there was strong favoritism. This led to competition and resentment. Now, I want to pause here for a moment and jump ahead of the story. We're in chapter 25. Would you turn with me to chapter 27? Chapter 27, and starting in verse 5. Now, Rebekah was listening as Isaac spoke to uh, his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt for game and bring it back, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat so that uh, I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, this is Rebecca saying to Jacob, now my son, listen carefully uh, and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two uh, choice young goats so I can prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may give you his blessings before he dies. Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, but my brother Esau is a hairy man while I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. His mother said to him, My son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. Go and get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and she prepared some tasty food, just the way his father liked it. Then Rebekah took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house and put them on her younger son Jacob. She also covered his hands with, and the smooth part of his neck with goat uh, skins. Then she handed, her, handed to her son Jacob the tasty food and the bread she had made. Now that, that took some conniving, didn't it? That took some conniving. Not only was the son a trickster, the mother was a trickster. Can you imagine skinning a goat 
and somehow getting that skin on his neck and on his arms to deceive the father? That was her plan. That's what she did. Favoritism, deceitfulness, wrong choices. Is this, what, is this the way God wanted things done? Parental favoritism. Remember how Jacob bought his youngest son? Remember he had 12 sons. He bought his youngest son the coat of, co of many colors? He wasn't shy about it. He let all the other 11 boys know that Joseph was his favorite, and I have bought this special coat for him. Parental favoritism. Remember how Jesse didn't even consider his young son David when Samuel came to anoint the next king of Israel? Samuel said, bring all your boys up. There's going to be a king of Israel anointed among your sons. He brought them all up beside, this, except for David. David was someplace in the field, tending the sheep. Samuel said, "No, this this can't. There's got to be another one around. The youngest, the little kid, the little scrawny kid. Go fetch him." David was the one. That was favoritism. Favoritism hinders right choices. Favoritism hinders right choices. The story of Esau and Jacob goes on in verse 29 of the 25th chapter. Once when Jacob was cooking I'm in competition with this fan up here. Uh, once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I am famished. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, man, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? Esau traded the lasting benefit of his birthright for the immediate pleasure of food. How many of you have ever had lentil soup? Have ever had lentils? They are good. They are real good. I, I have heard people say, I see why Esau sold, sold his birthright for lentils. They are real good. When you know how to fix them. But for food, what were those long lasting benefits that Esau was giving up? Well, the birthright equal a double portion of the family's inheritance, the right to be the family chief and priest, guardianship of the promise that God had given to Abraham. This is what Esau was giving up. But he acted on impulse. Remember last week's sermon. Esau was satisfying his immediate natural desires without pausing to consider the long-range consequences of what he was about to do. Without controlling the natural, the nature that's in all of us and causes us to sin. He was just yielding to the natural. Brother, we can also fall into that same trap. When we see something that we want, generally our first impulse, impulse is to get it. Once we obtain 
it we feel intensely satisfied and sometimes even powerful because we have obtained what we set out to get. I'll give you an example. You know, you uh, like to get a new car, but not just a new car. You want that BMW, but not just a BMW. You want the BMW 2 Series, brand coupe, red, all black interior. As you know, the BMW is the ultimate driving machine. You feel power. You feel powerful once you got that, that car, and you're sitting in that car, and you're sitting back, all black interior with the power. Now, I'm not saying that a new car or a new home or new clothes are wrong. I'm not saying that at all. But do you just get them on impulse? Do you just get them on impulse? Do you bring God into the picture? Or do you just act whimsically? And that's what sometimes we do. Immediate pleasure often loses sight of the future. We can avoid making Esau's mistake by comparing the short-term satisfaction with the long-term consequences before we act and by asking God's guidance in all of our decision making. That's the important thing. We want to follow God's guidance in all of our decision making. Lord, reign in me. Reign in my life. In my weakest hour. In the darkest night. Lord, reign in me. We can also appeal to Jesus Christ. Appeal to the new nature that we were talking about last week. That it is us, that it is in us through the new birth that's in Jesus Christ. Now, if we tend to exaggerate our circumstances or lie to ourselves in our minds like Esau did, we can also lose our perspective. What did Esau say? He said, I am famished. I am about to die. He wanted this soup because he said he was about to, was he about to die? What an exaggeration. Yes, after a hard day's work in the field, he was probably hungry. Probably very, very hungry. But about to die? Exaggerating the situation, lying to one's self to convince yourself of a need is just really an excuse or justification to fulfill your physical nature. It distorts reality. Here's the lesson. Getting through those short, pressure-filled moments is often the most difficult part of overcoming temptation. Let me repeat that. Getting through those short, pressure-filled moments is often the most difficult part of overcoming temptation. You have a guy walking down the street. He sees this young lady standing on the corner, short dress, you know, up to, up to, up to. And she's standing and he's looking He's eyeballing, and his mind is going bananas. Getting through those short, pressure-filled moments 
is often the most difficult part of overcoming a temptation. You don't make spur of the moment decisions. You think about the long range complications that will come about, not just the short term. Esau says, if I'm starving to death, what good is it a birthright anyway? If I'm starving to death, exaggerating the situation. Very short-sighted for temporary satisfaction. A cup of soup. What did Paul say about the attitude that Esau displayed? Let's jump to Hebrews, where Paul's, Paul is talking. Paul mentioned Esau. Hebrews 12, verse 16. Hebrews 12, 16. Seeing that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sowed his inheritance right, his inheritance right as the oldest son. Paul called it godless when Esau did. The word rendered godless means unholy, I'm sorry, uh, unhallowed or unholy, profane. The author of Hebrews accurately focuses upon the one area that revealed Esau as profane, the selling of his birthright. To be profane is to regard something as unhallowed or unholy, as I just mentioned, to make something that's sacred common. Esau took that which God considered sacred and made it common. Don't you? Genesis 28. Genesis 28, verse 10. Jacob from Beersheba, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain uh, place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth and its top reached to, into heaven. And the angels of uh, God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the east and to the west, uh, to the north and to the south. All people on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you. I will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. This is what Esau despised. The promises, all of the descendants, all of the blessings. God said, I will be with you and I will not leave you. But this is what Esau despised. And on top of that, that relationship with God. I'm getting close to the end. I know it's a little warm in here. Um, but we read just in Hebrews 12, 16 where Paul said Esau was godless in his attitude and approach toward his birthright. But in verse 17, right under that, said that later Esau wanted the inheritance blessings back. He wanted them back. But that 
he was rejected, even though he sought the blessings with tears. He could not change what he had done. I, I guess I turned from it, but that verse 17 of Hebrews 12 says, Afterwards, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessings with tears, he could not change what had been done. Now, you have to realize that these two boys grew up together. They were twins. They probably knew each other and each other's ha habits like two peas in a pod. They knew each other's strengths and each other's weaknesses. Indicative of early on discussions, arguments, interreactions, which was sufficient for Jacob to conclude how little Esau really valued the birthrights. I'm sure they had discussion after discussion about you're the oldest, everything is coming down to you. But Jacob knew that Esau did not want the birthright. Again, Jacob could evaluate his brother's character. And with proper timing, this would probably be easy pickings. Just a matter of waiting for the right time. And I'm going to take the birthright because of this because of his character. The second born was named Jacob, which meant supplanter, deceiver, trickster. And he lived by that name. He cheated his brother out of his birthright. It was a bad choice. He and his mother, Rebecca, deceived Isaac in his very old age, keeping Esau from receiving a blessing from Isaac. Bad choice. He worked from his he worked for his uncle 14 years rather than just seven years to get his wife Rebecca and marry her. Remember? Laban was a trickster too. He tricked, he tricked him. You work seven years, you can marry my daughter. Well, Leah was the oldest, so he got me. No, I want Rachel. Worked for me another seven years, which he did. It was a good choice. It was a good choice. Jacob quickly made friends with his brother Esau in later years for fear that Esau would retaliate and kill him. Good choice. Bill and I talked about that earlier today. Esau came with, was it, 400 men? And Jacob said, wow, I'm in trouble. He's going to get me for what I've done to him. So he made friends with him real quick. Right choice. Another choice. Jacob wanted, to, wanted a blessing from God and literally wrestled with God all night until God conceded to give Jacob a blessing. Good choice. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Choices. Some good choices, some bad choices. How badly do you want right choices in your life? How badly do you want right choices in your life? Well, I want you to turn with me with one final scripture. This is again in Genesis 32. Genesis 32, starting in verse 22. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives 
his two female servants and his eleven sons and cross the ford of the uh, Jacob. After uh, he had sent them across the stream, uh, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob, let's see. Well, I think this is the story uh, of Jacob. I, I put that in my note again. The most, where where he, he wrestled with God. He wrestled with God. He wanted a particular blessing. So I won't read that. But in conclusion, choices. Do you bring God into your decision making? Do you want God that much in your life? makes a big difference. It makes a big difference in how we conduct ourselves. Father, uh, thank you for the lesson of Esau. We know that uh, he had a twin brother. They were at odds in so many ways. Father, but um, he did not relish, Father, what you had for him. He made some really bad decisions, not only in this part of the story, but we found that he, he married outside of the family. Bad decisions with wives. Father, we want to learn to make the right decisions, and we want you in our lives. Life is made up of bad decisions, good decisions, and some things we're not sure of, we need to make sure that we bring them to you for your direction and your guidance. Thank you so very much that we can glean from this particular story. Help us to take away from it that we want you in every decision that we make. Daily, we're making decisions. And we want those decisions to honor you, to please you, not be from our Lord nature, but from that new nature through Jesus Christ. We thank you. We just ask your blessings and now and for all that we do in the remainder of this day. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.